Thank you. The Library Cultural Competence Community of Practice is delighted to welcome you to this seminar in our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Knowledge Seminar Series, offered in conjunction with the Office of the Deputy Vice-Chancellor, Indigenous Strategy and Services. Our seminar series includes a total of six talks held during 2018, presented by experts on areas including history and language, cultural astronomy, connection to country, visual arts, health, and perspectives on gender. Today our seminar focuses on health, and we'll hear from two distinguished guests, Professor Elizabeth Elliott, AM, Discipline of Child and Adolescent Health, Faculty of Medicine and Health, University of Sydney, and Professor Jane Latimer, School of Public Health, University of Sydney. Before we welcome our speakers to the stage and begin proceedings, I'd like to acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. It is upon their ancestral lands that the University of Sydney is built. As we share our own knowledge, teaching, learning and research practices within this university, may we also pay respect to the knowledge and better forever within the Aboriginal custodianship of country. I'll now hand over to Edward Luca, who will introduce our seminar. Uh, the total of the talk is on the screen. Uh, alcohol use in pregnancy is common in Australia, and fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is a tragic consequence of this. Although FASD occurs throughout society, Aboriginal women led the way in facing this taboo subject and taking measures to prevent alcohol use in pregnancy, diagnose FASD, and support families and communities living with the disorder. The Little One Project, which was instrumental in garnering wider community and political support to address the disorder, was initiated by courageous women in the Fitzroy Valley in Western Australia. They invited clinicians and academics, today's speakers, from the university to assist them in furthering their strategy. This included conducting Australia's first population-based prevalence study for FASD, providing education and developing clinical capacity. The consultation process, study results and the film Tristan, made during the project and shown at the UN Permanent Forum for Indigenous Issues in New York, will be presented today. So we're delighted to have our two speakers um, with us, and we'd like to welcome them to the stage to discuss this incredible project. Thank you very much, Elizabeth and Jane. Uh, thanks very much for the invitation to speak today. It's a great uh, privilege to be here and to be able to share a story, which is really a celebration of the initiative of very courageous Aboriginal women who wanted to improve life for their community and particularly their children. Um, we too would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay respects to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. Um, this is partly our story, but it's predominantly the story of the Aboriginal community of the Fitzroy Valley. June Oscar, who was one of the um, chief investigators on this project, and in fact, one of the initiators of the project, is now our social justice commissioner in at the Human Rights Commission. She was trying to get here today, but she's uh, had to prepare for her Senate estimates appearance. So she sends her regards. And of course, Fitzroy Crossing is about 18 hours from, from Sydney. So uh, we're unable to have any of our other Aboriginal community members who we'd normally have speaking with us. So we're gonna have a talk, we're gonna have a film, we're gonna leave time for discussion. <coughs> and I'd like to first invite Jane to really take us back before the Lil One project and tell us what preceded that. Thanks so much. And thanks so much, Edward, for inviting us here today to um, what sounds like a wonderful seminar series. And I'm so sad that I just came to actually learn about it today, but you can guarantee I'm going to be at your next one on the gender issues. So thank you so much. But before we begin, I too would like to acknowledge that we meet on the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders, both past and present and I thank them for their custodianship of this land. And I'd also like to acknowledge the Aboriginal leaders of the communities of the Fitzroy Valley, whose courage and strength lie at the heart of this collaboration. And as Liz said, we'd hoped that June might be able to come and she was extremely interested, but she's the first uh, 
female Aboriginal social justice commissioner that Australia has had, and consequently she's uh, incredibly busy. So we therefore share their work, uh, this work on their behalf too. Um, so as Liz said, today I'm going to describe how this work began and the diverse collaborations we built to drive this work. Liz is then going to talk to you about FASD, what the condition is, and the Little One project that was such an important catalyst for raising support uh, for the, a lot of the later FASD work that we did. And then we're going to screen for you a short film that shows you the human cost of this condition. Uh, and it's focused on a little boy with FASD called Tristan. And I'll explain a little bit more to you about that before we film it. Uh, and then Liz is going to finish with a real update on all the progress that has been made since this Little One project. But, uh, and so, as I said, June Oscar was such an important part of this work. Also, Maureen Carter, who's CEO of Nindungari Cultural Health, which is the Aboriginal uh, controlled health facility in Fitzroy Crossing. And Emily Carter, who's the CEO of the Aboriginal Manawanakura Women's Resource Centre, uh, the uh, organisation in the community really supporting and helping women. And Dr James Fitzpatrick, who was the PhD student uh, that worked with Liz and I, a highly accomplished paediatrician, uh, who was a finalist in the West Australian Australian of the Year Awards just last year, and has been driving a lot of this work with Liz also across Australia. But to come back to the beginning, in 2007, uh, there we are, we've got this. Um, uh, yeah, I was travelling with my sister, who had recently been appointed to the Human Rights Commission, when we met a group of courageous women in Fitzroy Crossing, northwestern Australia. And Fitzroy Crossing is actually a five and a half hour, a five hour flight up to Broome and then four and a half hours in a four-wheel drive down here to Fitzroy Crossing. And it was there that we met June Oscar and Emily Carter, women in their 50s, living in Fitzroy Crossing in the remote Kimberley region of Australia, who were championing alcohol restrictions for their community. Uh, June is a Boonaba woman, and her country is some of the most beautiful in Australia, that of Winjana Gorge. Uh, and Tunnel Creek. And some of you may have heard of Jandamara, who was the very famous Aboriginal warrior. He was a Boonaba man, and of course he held out against the pastoralists who were coming up from the south and claiming vast tracts of the Kimberley as their own, or stealing Boonaba country, as June and the Boonaba people would say. And so he held out in Tunnel Creek for around three years, and he's incredibly important in the stories of the Boonaba people. <clears throat> and Emily Carter, the CEO of Manawanakura, she's a Guniandi woman, and both these women speak over four different languages. But in 2006, the communities of the Fitzroy Valley were in crisis. 13 young people had suicided, all in some way related to alcohol. That year, the community attended 50 funerals in 52 weeks. Enough was enough, they resolved. The unregulated supply of grog into their communities had to be managed. And so in 2007, the women of the Fitzroy Valley held a bush meeting where they talked over five days about how to stem the flow of grog into their communities. And at that meeting, they devised a plan to lobby the head of the West Australian Liquor Licensing Board to impose restrictions on the sale of full strength alcohol, takeaway alcohol, for all people living and passing through the Fitzroy Valley. This was the first time that a community initiated solution had been enacted. Um, it was really smart because it was non discriminatory. It didn't matter whether you were Indigenous or not, anyone passing through the Fitzroy Valley could not go along to the takeaway and get full strength alcohol because they'd recognised that that's where their problem lay. People backing up the ute, getting cartons of full strength beer and then taking it out to the communities. Of course, you could still go and get a full strength beer in the uh, pub if you wanted to, but then the licensee had an obligation to make sure he served you uh, appropriately. And so that's why they were very smart in the way they initiated these. And in actual fact, 
uh, these restrictions produced some of the greatest improvements seen in the community in over 25 years. And they're documented here on this slide. So they actually led to a 45% reduction in alcohol-related hospital admissions, a 27% in alcohol fuel reduction in alcohol-fueled violence, importantly a 14% increase in school attendance, and of course an 88% reduction in takeaway alcohol sales, although you could still get takeaway low alcohol beer. And that was based on a report done not long after the alcohol restrictions came in, the University of Notre Dame in 2008. And really, these women showed us that despite limited access to power and money, as well as immense geographical and language barriers, individuals can create positive change in their community. And so here was an article in the London Times that really reported on the women who'd saved their town from alcoholism. Of course, understanding that they were leading a lot of the work, but with a lot of support from the men and women of the Fitzroy Valley's communities who also supported the initiative. And so uh, my twin sister and I heard about this initiative and we thought, what could we do that might raise the visibility of this promising practice and share this, what they were doing in Fitzroy Cross Crossing across Australia, but also uh, with the world at the United Nations. And so together with the community and the Australian Human Rights Commission, we decided to make a film called Yajalara, which means to dream in the language of the Bunaba people, because this was the dream that they had of a better community for their children and their elders. And this documentary documented the journey of their alcohol restrictions. Of course, it was decided that I'd be the producer, and in actual fact, I was a researcher in low back pain, so it did look like the film might be seriously doomed. But we got ourselves an amazing film director called Melanie Hogan, uh, and she had uh, directed this film. And the picture we you see here is the cover of the DVD. Um, it's, it has the Boab tree that is seen right across these areas of the Kimberley. But before this work could begin, we needed to get some funding to have, uh, drive this film. And after I'd had several failed attempts to interest BHP, Rio Tinto, a few banks in our work, we found an incredibly generous Australian who, after speaking to him for around 15 minutes about our project, replied that he wanted to fund the entire movie on two conditions. One, that he remain anonymous, as he just wanted to make a difference uh, where he could without any acknowledgement. And secondly, that I only was to report progress if there was something that he and his family could learn. And this funding was just so important in catalyzing and starting this enormous body of work that has gone forward. So once we had that in store, uh, over several weeks, I, with the film crew, traveled to Fitzroy Crossing and we lived with June and the Bunaba people where we shot the footage for Yajalara. And this is how my relationship with June, Emily, Maureen and the communities of the Fitzroy Valley began. And here is us making the film. Here's June Oscar with her mother, Mona, who's really Fitzroy Valley's greatest barramundi fisherwoman. Um, and what you can't see is, but just outside this shot is a very large crocodile waiting to come and get the uh, actually barbecued chicken that I'd naively bought at the service station for lunch down here. Uh, but we survived uh, and made the film. And of course, once we had all this footage, it was then up to us to come back to city, Sydney to edit the film and then to start sharing the promising practice of the Fitzroy Valley with the rest of Australia and later with the world by launching Yajalara at the, the United Nations in New York. Uh, at that time, uh, Governor General was Quentin Bryce and she quickly became an incredibly strong supporter of this work. And she was so important in raising the awareness of it. And here you'll see a private reception that she held at her residence in Yarralumla in Canberra, where she invited every minister with responsibility for Indigenous affairs to this event. She screened Yajalara. Um, here we brought June, uh, June and Emily down from the community. Melanie Hogan, who just had, was pregnant when we were shooting this film, and here's the baby that she subsequently had. Um, and myself and my sister. And it was fantastic because uh, we were able 
to get her to hold a private reception for our anonymous donor where she thanked him on behalf of Australia for his support of this initiative. But I think the highlight of the journey was taking the opportunity to take the story of Fitzroy Crossing to the UN. And in 2009, we travelled with June and Emily and Tanya Plibersek, who at that time was the Minister uh, for Women, to, uh, to New York as the Australian Government and the Human Rights Commission launched Yajlara in the UN, UN headquarters. And June Oscar started by addressing the UN in language saying it was the first time that the peoples of Manhattan had ever heard the voices of her people. Tanya Plibersek then uh, talked about how important these alcohol restrictions were to Australia. And then Yajalara screamed to a very packed audience of UN human rights commissioners, country delegations, world heads of NGOs and Indigenous people from around the world dealing with the pain of alcohol. And following the screening, the audience gave the women a standing ovation and thanked them for the courage and the bravery in sustaining these alcohol restrictions against a very highly organised opposition. And as a result of the women telling their story, we were able to negotiate new wordings in the agreed conclusions that came out of that UN forum. Uh, the wordings that really mattered to June and Emily and Indigenous people across Australia and to make sure that the definitions of family included kinship and community obligations, so important to Jim and Emily. And this wording then remained in the final resolutions, which is critical, uh, of that UN meeting, and they were then taken home by the 192 nations of the world that had attended the forum and used to follow, formulate women's policy in those countries across the world. And so in doing this, you see how this film helped raise the voices of women working at the grassroots so they could come to influence policy globally. But the legacy of alcohol misuse is now seen in the number of children across the valley thought to be affected by fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, or FASD as it's commonly known, a range of disorders that occur in both Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities across Australia where mothers drink alcohol during pregnancy. Of course, alcohol has an extremely toxic effect on the brain of a developing fetus, and exposed children may be born with significant damage to the brain and other organs, and Liz is going to tell you much more about this shortly. In 2009, June Oscar gave an address to the parliament in Canberra, where she said, we also knew we were facing another crisis, a time bomb of immense and horrifying magnitude, the number of children born with clear signs of fetal alcohol syndrome or FAS was noticeably increasing in our community. Um, FASD is a tragedy that somehow transcends other aspects of grief and trauma. Here is innocent young life, the future of our people and all that goes with it. Our culture, our language, knowledge about the magic creation and laws of this country being born into this world with brains and nervous systems that are so impaired that life for that person from birth to death is cruelly diminished. And June spoke so powerfully in the parliament about this issue. So FASD affects a child in utero, but it damages their brain for life. And paediatricians had estimated that around 30% of children in the Fitzroy Valley may have been affected. But up until then, there was no high quality evidence to support these estimations. So in uh, October 2009, we received a small amount of philanthropic funding that we used to head back to the communities to discuss what support we could next provide and whether a study to estimate the number of children that may be affected by FASD would be beneficial for the community and provide hard data about the burden of this condition. And by this time, I'd met Liz, uh, one of Australia's leading experts in FASD, and I asked her if she would join us and assist in this community consultation. So over a period of two weeks, Liz and I and a number of others met with all the stakeholders in the Fitzroy Valley, Indigenous elders from the four language groups, and parents and carers of children with FASD. And following that, it became very clear that there was overwhelming support for a prevalent study that would gather strong evidence about the number of children affected. And thus the Little One Project, a term meaning all the little ones, was born. And it was part of an overall strategy to address FASD called the Maralu Strategy that focused on diagnosis, management and support. 
but how to find the funding to start this big project and how could we interest people in our work. So on our return to Sydney, we reached out to some creatives like MNC Saatchi, the leading communications and advertising agency. And we asked them if they could help us take this issue from a funder's head to their heart so that they might empty their wallets in support of this. And they uh, gave us some very important advice, uh, suggesting that we must steer the approach away from damaged children and neglected neglectful parents and look to the bigger issue that would speak to many Australians and others in the world, the potential for the loss of thousands of years of Indigenous culture, that alcohol can cause brain injury and interfere with the transfer of the Dreamtime stories, songs and ceremonies so central to the lives of Aboriginal people. And so they helped us develop a series of resources that we could use in approaching funders. And I just show you uh, one here because I think it spoke to the really important creative lens they bring and how it can help you know, expand the collective impact that some of this work can have. And they had the idea that we would uh, identify high net worth individuals and we would send them a letter uh, which was a call for action about our project. But it would also include a photograph of an Indigenous child with the tagline, don't let our dream time stories disappear. This photograph would be incorrectly fixed and sit in the uh, envelope, but once the envelope was opened, the photograph come, came out and exposed the light. Over about 15 seconds, the image would fade to black. Speaking to this idea that alcohol causes people to fade away, it causes the memories of children to fade away, to disappear. And uh, it was very um, powerful in the messaging that it gave. They also uh, helped the community develop storybooks that really shared the story of what they'd done. And one of them was called The Story of How Alcohol Tried to Destroy a Community but Was Beaten by a Clever Idea. So I think now I'll hand over to Liz, who's going to take over and tell you about FASD and the Little One Project. Uh, thanks very much, Jane. And what Jane didn't say was that we did get some philanthropic funding, a relatively small amount of money, but it enabled us to do work for a whole year in the Fitzroy Valley. And subsequently, we received NHMRC funding and also funding from government, both from Faxia and uh, from Health. So I'm just going to briefly tell, us, tell you a little bit about what we know about alcohol use in pregnancy and FASD, really because we want to emphasise that this is not just a problem for Indigenous people. We know that alcohol is neurotoxic, that is it damages the nerves, the developing nerves and brain, and it's teratogenic, that is it disrupts the development of the organs in the unborn child. So any child prenatally <coughs> exposed to alcohol is potentially at risk of harm. And in Australia, unfortunately, well, uh, nationwide, we have a drinking culture. We all know that there's a lot of binge drinking in teens. And interestingly, the unplanned pregnancy rate is still at around 50%. So there's a lot of inadvertent exposure to alcohol. And we know that alcohol use in pregnancy is common. The maternal blood alcohol level passes immediately. Sorry. The maternal alcohol level passes immediately to the unborn child who then has the same blood alcohol level. Um, but when people ask me how much can I drink, I say I can't tell because in an individual pregnancy there are many modifiable factors. Age, liver function test, genetics of the mother and the baby, capacity to metabolise alcohol, etc. So the advice we give women is that the best option is to avoid alcohol both in pregnancy and in the three months prior to pregnancy. And I just put this slide up to show you that this message is not getting through. So I'm involved in research in two cohorts of pregnant women, uh, were pregnant women, um, once one in Victoria and one in New South Wales. And in those cohorts, around 60% of women are telling us that they've drunk during their pregnancy. Now, many will stop once they realise they're pregnant, but often they've had high level drinking at a family. 21st or a wedding or some other occasion before they realise they're pregnant. So we've got to get this message out to women before they even consider pregnancy. So why are we so worried about this? Alcohol disrupts the development of the brain and as you can see from this photo can really completely um, damage the brain resulting in a brain that you can see would not work that one on the, the right. 
uh, it's small and it's totally disrupted. So in addition, even in the absence of structural change to the brain, we can see change to the function of the brain. Alcohol can impair growth of the unborn baby and subsequently it can result in a whole range of birth defects and an abnormal face. And the abnormal face is one thing that has been a recent frequently described, but we now realise is less important than the brain damage. So all children will have brain damage, only those exposed in a specific time in the first trimester will have these characteristic facial features. So if you have a quick look at each other, um, we are concerned about a thin upper lip, uh, an indistinct philtrum, the area between the nose and the upper lip, and small eye openings. All of these are disrupted by alcohol exposure. And this is just to make the point that this is a spectrum, that some children will have facial features and birth defects, all of them will have brain damage, and a lot of those children are falling below the surface, they're more difficult to recognise. So this is the exa an example of the type of boy that I see in my clinic at the Children's Hospital at Westmead. You can't tell here, but he's got a small head, he's got small eye openings, smaller than we would expect. He's got this long indistinct philtrum, a thin upper lip, and he presented to me at three years of age with severe developmental learning and behavioural problems. And that raises the issue, what happens to these children? Jane mentioned that this is a lifelong uh, injury to the brain. Obviously early intervention can improve outcomes, but we know that the outcomes for adults are poor. Higher rates of mental illness, substance abuse, sexual problems, and very few of these adults can live and work independently. We know now that uh, the rate of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder in juvenile justice in Australia is around 33%. We know that this disorder has a huge economic burden, not on the impact, on, the impact on families, but on disability, education, community, justice, health and child protection services. And just recently we're getting data out of Canada to suggest that the average age at death is 34 in adults with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, often from um, accidents and injuries, suicide, drug use, um, but we're also now realising that alcohol exposure in utero damages the organ systems and that later in life these people are presenting with kidney or heart or other organ damage. So now I want to move on to the Little and One project, um, which Jane mentioned. And we did this in three stages. In stage one in 2010, we identified and interviewed all women of children who were born in 2002 and three in the whole of the Fitzroy Valley. Now this sounds an easy um, thing to do. Uh, it wasn't a huge cohort of kids, but they were scattered hundreds of kilometres across the country often in communities that were only accessible during the dry season, only accessible by four-wheel drives. In the second stage, we went back and spent a year examining all those children in detail. And in the third stage, we did a lot of data analysis, publication, community feedback, importantly, uh, and reporting, and also examined the health service use of these children. And this just shows one of the challenges. So Jane mentioned, if Qantas uh, flies direct to Broome, which is only for part of the year. You can get there in five years, five, uh, five hours, a five hour drive out to Fitzroy. But once you get to Fitzroy Crossing, um, shown here in the, uh, there, there's often a 200 kilometre drive out to these remote communities. There are no, there is no accommodation in the Fitzroy Valley apart from in Fitzroy Crossing, which meant that when we were out of Fitzroy Crossing, we had to camp. I was told never to camp in a riverbed. Um, our Aboriginal guide assured us that this would be safe, but uh, it did rain during the night. <laughs> Fortunately, we were not washed away. Um, and of course, there are climatic challenges. Um, even at the moment, it's 42 degrees in Fitzroy. It can go up to 56 degrees out there uh, for four months of the year. Um, it's the wet season and this is the hotel we stay at in Fitzroy Crossing. In that particular year it was totally uh, isolated for three or four weeks and we know the region is subject to bushfires and also to um, cyclones. 
Um, the other challenge is language and cultural protocol. And as any of you who've worked in uh, Indigenous communities will know, you can't just bowl into a community. You really have to be accompanied by someone from that community who speaks that language and who invites and welcomes you into that community. So we employed what we called community navigators, and here you see um, uh, two, two of those with their new tents, which they were very pleased with, um, who really brokered every relationship we had with members of the community. This is stage one of the project, and here you see James, who um, is our, was our PhD student, Emily, who's ever present in case there are cultural or language issues, and one of the young mums who we uh, questioned. And we asked them about a whole lot of aspects of their, their lives and their child's lives. They were very generous in, in providing information. We really emphasised that this was not a project about shaming and blaming them, but trying to help them and to help their child. And so one of the things we were asking about was antenatal alcohol exposure. And to assist us in doing this, we photographed the grog that was locally available in the community. And they were able to point out what they drank and how much and when during the pregnancy. And what we found was that actually the rate of drinking was about 50% in these women during pregnancy, which is around what we see even today, um, nearly 10 years later, in non-Indigenous communities. But what we found was that either people didn't drink or those who drank, drank at very high levels. And these are, uh, levels are scored using a, a system we use called the Audit C. But what does that actually mean? Well, it means that some of these women were drinking 10 or more drinks uh, every one to two weeks, two to three times a week, or daily, or almost daily. So the 50% who were drinking were drinking at very high levels, potentially damaging to the unborn child. And I think when we talk about alcohol, particularly in disadvantaged communities, we've got to understand that women don't drink to, to harm their baby. They tell us that they drink because of the underlying stress that they're living in, the stress of overcrowding, domestic violence, isolation, unemployment, and, and lack of opportunity. And again, it's important to be compassionate and understand that. And in identifying a child with developmental problems, it does give us an opportunity to offer assistance to women, particularly in uh, putting them in touch with drug and alcohol services. So in the second year, we came back and we brought a team with us. We had ear doctors, eye doctors, paediatricians, uh, psychologists, child psychologist, a child physio, a child occupational therapist, and a child speech therapist. And these people lived on and off in the community over that year, uh, with Jane and I visiting uh, regularly to, to supervise what was going on, uh, and really established very strong relationships with those families and with the community members. And although we discussed the risks of exposing the community as having a lot of problems with the community, as Jane said, they wanted to proceed with this study. And indeed, we found that 55% were exposed to high levels of alcohol, and about one in five, 19% of these children fulfilled the diagnostic criteria for fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. And they exhibited the whole range of problems that we see in these children. Not only the physical and growth problems, but extreme behavioural problems, mental health problems, problems with IQ, memory, academic achievement, um, problems with speech and language and motor skills. But in doing these assessments, it enabled us to identify not only the needs of these children and get them the appropriate therapy, but to ident identify their strengths and to really help um, support those strengths. I just want to raise one other issue, and, and that is that these children are living in situations which are extremely stressful. They are all exposed to what we call early life trauma, trauma in early childhood. 90% of them in this cohort were exposed to early life trauma. 20% of them had been in touch with the Department of Child Protection. What I mean by early life trauma is that 45 of these children had a death in a close family member, which upset the child. 42% of mums reported food insecurity, money worries, fighting in the house, overcrowding, drug use in the house. Um, I mentioned the child protection issues. But in 14%, there was drug and alcohol use daily in the household. Person with mental health, 
uh, etc. So we, we've got to understand the context that these children are coming from and we now know that early life trauma is also a contributor to neurodevelopmental and behavioural problems in children. So what we'd like to do at this stage is show you the film Tristan and Tristan is a film about a little boy who was at the time 12 who is cared for by Marmanji and Jeff. Uh, Marmanji is an Aboriginal woman who's a teacher in the Fitzroy Valley High School and Jeff is her <coughs> partner. And she looks after Tristan, who is her nephew and two little grandchildren. So, uh, who also have FASD. So that's the context of the film and we'd be really interested in, in what impact this film has on you. Uh, it has been shown widely in Aboriginal communities around Australia and non-Aboriginal communities and uh, overseas and people say it, it does give them a real understanding of what the challenges are. So what's happening? You're shaking. Yeah. See how his voice is more relaxed? <laughs> now, do you want me to have a drink of water for you here, Tristan? Okay. <clears throat> well, you can play with that while I go and get you a drink. And then we're going to have a go with that first sheet. <laughs> I'm Tristan McCarthy. I am 12 years old. I live in Swear Crossing. My dog named Black. And my dog is with me. I live here. For the Southern and Graydon. Joanna, and I just telling you. Right? Well, that's been dead ages. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 Tylan and Quaden, I mean, because the grandmotherly instinct kicked in, and when those kids were under threat, which the, through the, the problems that their parents had, uh, meant the kids were under threat, so Mum and G took them on board. Firstly, uh, Tylan when he was about ten know, months old, ten months old, and then Quaden when he was about two. Dad, 
nothing is bad. Because when your mum drinks beer, and when you go to your mum, she'll be a bit silly in the head. He's talking about his mum. He only goes to his mum sometimes. Yeah, but we'll see him at the Ovals. Because he does the Ovals. Because he's in jail. It was a funny situation with Tristan. I was called up to Janjua. I found Tristan just laying, because he was only about that, oh, is he that, that big? He was laying there, he was dehydrated, he had red raw, you know, from here. Um, probably wasn't given a bath for a week, and, you know, all this was chaped and red raw, and he was still in his own you know, in these pieces. So oh, here I am. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> With this baby. And, mm, so. But, um, you know, like Jeffrey said that. <laughs> the motherly instinct kicked in. <laughs> Yeah. One night I was giving Tristan a bath in the sink and his head looked unusually large and that's when we, I said we need to get him up to the hospital straight away. He went off to Perth and I flew with my sister. In the meantime he was in hospital and that's when social services and everybody in Perth noticed that uh, my sister was actually neglecting him while he was down there in hospital and was actually bringing in a flask of, and then they noticed that she was intoxicated every time because she nearly fell off the bed while he, she was down there. Well, in, in my way, if I was looking after him, I was pissed I couldn't uh, look after him. And and she gave, gave it to my big sister to look after. So I talk very well, and I'm going to school good, so they can understand, you know, you know to talk to them. In my problem, when I was drinking, when I was caring with him, and he got a slow mind, I think, maybe six years old. No. I was wrong. Drinking with him. Damage his brains. When women are pregnant, um they if they drink smoke so the kid like gets a little bit silly inside. Um, and um, that's been happening a lot down here in Fitzroy. When I first became aware about what fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is, I was horrified because then it just it was there, then and there, that I realized that, my God, there are so many people in my community that are affected by this. It's a humanitarian crisis. Tristan Tylan and Quaden really represent the, the whole spectrum of, of the disorder. 
as well as the, the whole spectrum of behavioural learning and health and developmental problems that, that can be possible in children exposed to alcohol during pregnancy. So this is an incredibly complex family with hugely complex needs and you know I'll bet the playing field changes from day to day. They're going to really, hurt each other. Until... Oh, that's how I want to You better stop. And you better stop it. Oh, quick, go over there. Get, up, get away from your brother. Go away. Tell him, go over there and get your line, quickly. Go away. They all got different emotional needs. They all got different learning needs so they're all so different each one and you get a big you know we have to work with them differently and individually the forgetting of things the uh the sort of disconnectedness at different times the um the linkages you know getting the linkages between things which sometimes disappears and it, and it varies between you know you can take tristan who who might forget from sort of one minute to the next to longer period of time where things just disappear and then come back. Dad, what's today? Today is Thursday. I think. Yeah, Thursday. Thursday. Tomorrow is Friday. One of the differences that I've noticed with the FASD children, um, it may take a lot longer to get through an assessment and it's just because they may not understand the instruction first time, so it may take a couple of different ways for them to understand what you're actually wanting them to do. You may have to demonstrate it, you may have to say it in a couple of different ways, they may be zoned out. certainly very apparent that keeping concentration over a period of time is difficult. So you might have to give them a bit of time just to kick the ball around and have some play, then come back to what you're wanting them to do. You may have to have a drink. <laughs> so I guess it's, it, um, we've had to work on lots of different angles to keep kiddies on task to get them across the line. Yeah, can you have a break? Yeah. You can have a break. Here, have a fiddle with the with the tornado. See if you can make it again like you did before. Okay, okay. Cool. Doing really well. So um I think what we might do is take him down to sport. Yep. And then after recess, have another go. Is that okay, Tristan? Where do you go on the weekends, Tristan? Uh, sometimes to the sometimes to the river and footy, but I'll go everywhere. You go everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> I just like to go to the footy to be that burning up pile for if if you be a burning up pile you can win money for that if you run around and but I but I am just bandit but but sometimes I I don't spend it much I just like ten dollars on my and I leave the rest. Everyone goes to the in his way. 
the community song here. Russian is my brother. He is nine. One is my sister. She is fourteen. I live here with my mom. <laughs> mom and them told me that I had to go to prayer because my mom was drinking too much. <laughs> Sometimes I could like think I could change my mom and like make her stop drinking and stuff and wish there was something like to cure Tristan or me and like Sebastian because he has two holes in his heart. But I don't know. I feel sorry for their future because, and it's particularly someone like Tristan who, who is faced with a pretty bleak future if you look at it in terms of how the normal population would expect the opportunities to open up to you as you get older. <laughs> His inability to be able to read and write properly. The issues that he has with starting a new day every day means that the, the sort of way our society operates is that you have to be able to remember all those things and be able to take one thing on to the next day is, is not there and so he's going to face all sorts of challenges. Okay, guys, we're running late. And then there's the ability to be able to sustain relationships. And one of the things for Tristan is he's a very, very sensitive kid and he loves people to love him. And there's a good chance, because of the issues that he's got, that he's going to run into the rejection factor, which affects him so badly. Guys, get the first goal on you. It's always for us thinking, well, you know, will they end up in the justice system, you know, because, you know, a lot of our kids and researchers are saying that most children who, have, who are exposed to alcohol during pregnancy end up in prison. Uh, part of the problem of, of not being able to do those connections that we talked about, you know, the short term to long term memory stuff. Good example, we can tell Tristan five, six, seven, eight, nine times to go and have a shower or to have his breakfast, and that's okay. We understand that you've got to do that for it to be able to sink in and for him to be able to do it. But if he's in a situation where a policeman tells him to move on as a 15 year old or a 16 year old, and he doesn't move on because it do he doesn't process it in the same manner that you, know, you normally would, then he's seen to be willful. The normal reaction is, you know, you push against it. Yeah. And then one of the problems is that the reaction a lot of these kids is they push back. Yeah. And then, of course, you, the, the, the system will always win. And the, that's how those kids end up entering the juvenile system. And that system doesn't really care whether you're FASD or not. Tristan, do you want to put the phone down? I forgot to... Now, this is an interview, okay? So you need to look at me and you need to listen. And when I ask you the question, you're going to answer in your own words. So this time, you're not saying what I say. You're saying your own thoughts, okay? Your own words. Oh, and you're going to use a nice, big, deep voice. Yeah. Swap over. Swap over. Okay, yeah. Because I like my favourite chair. Oh, no, my very dear. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to try that last one again? Okay, you tell me when you're ready to do some more of this. You right? Yeah. Oh, fantastic. So we're going to just do this second sheet again. Wow. <laughs> this is my school. I go to school every day. It's 
E R. We say it's with me all the time. Mm. Oops. Over. Over. Some of the school is it hard and a bit boring. Letter. L. What's the next letter? L. What's the next letter? Luck. Mm -hmm. That last letter, what's the name of that letter? Uh -huh. I wish I could be a bit of a different grab. It's got burgers. And the logo in the jail. Nah, I'd, I'd say it's pretty fun if I be able to. I, I just want to be normal. Just I, I just want to be normal. At the moment, there's very little in our schools that assists a child suffering FASD. In the mid 1990s, I had a little child in my class and I worked closely with the school nurse and he was about eight or nine and we knew there was something wrong with him. We knew of FAS, but the FASD wasn't spoken about. No one knew of FASD and we knew this kid didn't have the features of a, of a strong FAS child, but he had the behaviors. There was no impulse control. He wouldn't complete tasks. He would distract others. He had no understanding of body proximity and he would be always in people's space that would get him into trouble. There was something missing about this child and the school nurse and I just couldn't work it out. So it, it became frustrating for him particularly. Um, and then later when he left and he went on to high school, he dropped out of high school. And then it was the usual pathway. He started to be of interest to the justice system, um, break an entry and then small things like that. And then he ended up in, in jail. And he was in and out of jail for about five years. And then the last I heard of him, he was, he'd hung himself in jail. So he was another death in custody. And I often think about this young chap and I, I just think that had we known about this, had the school been resourced, had I had the knowledge, had his parents been supported? Had there been some really intervention? You know, I, I feel positive his life would have been far different to the, to the tragic pathway he ended up taking in life. We all need to work together on this matter. Because it can't happen any other way. We cannot just leave the families themselves to deal with this. Those of us working in this field figure that fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is a big problem in this community. While the effects of alcohol on the child's brain are lifelong, there is a certain degree of plasticity of, of brain function. So with early diagnosis, and really the earlier bet, the better, and early intervention, people living with FASD have a greater chance of avoiding trouble with the law, homelessness, um, poor educational outcomes, substance abuse, and mental health problems. Currently FASD is not recognised as a disability in Australia and this disadvantages the young people and their families enormously. What the government needs to do is to make FASD a disability so that we can enable mechanisms that support these young people and their families, their teachers, their future employees to, to give them a, a shot at, at becoming their best. <laughs> Tristan 
Once people uh, made aware that this child or this individual um, is behaving in this way because of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, you suddenly see a different response. You see an instant softening in and caring that comes from people once they're, they're informed. <laughs> the, the biggest difference in helping that person is, is our change in attitude that's going to help because the person with FASD can't change. They're born with their condition. I love being with my family and friends. I like, I, I like being with, I like being with my family. I like being with my family. And I like being with my friends. With my family. Oh. Got to say it all. I like being with my family. I like being with my family and friends. So we're just going to um, tell you a little bit now about the impacts of the Lilil One project and then we want to come back and allow plenty of time for discussion and uh, for questions. So this study has had impacts at many levels, locally in the community, nationally and internationally. And I just want to run you through a few of the um, benefits that the community told us that this project has. So it had obviously enabled health and hearing and eye checks in, in children, diagnosis if relevant of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, and most importantly, a management plan and treatment for those problems. It enabled referrals to local health services, extra help at school and support for families. Um, it, it also enabled, raised really the level of awareness of the potential harms of alcohol use in pregnancy. We provided a lot of employment and education of local people. Um, we're supporting local health givers um, and we developed a number of tools that have subsequently been able to be used for screening and diagnosis in other Aboriginal communities. The community was really praised for having the courage to, to tackle this taboo subject, but they did emphasise that we mustn't stigmatise Ab Aboriginal people for the reasons I've mentioned, that this is really a problem uh, worldwide. Uh, you identified from that film that there were a number of behavioural and learning problems uh, uh, which manifest at home and at school, and so a local school teacher, uh, as a result of this study, developed a resource for school teachers, and that's just currently being uh, revised. Also, it made teaching and teachers realise that we cannot expect uh, the same sort of things from these children as we might from children with normal uh, intellect. And so they've developed alternative pathways of education to, to enable these children to do gardening, sport, uh, learn vocational skills that might enable them to make a valuable contribution to the community. And these are some kids learning to be baristas. 
Um, the data has really enabled us time and time again to advocate on behalf of the community to, for the um, maintenance of, of community-led alcohol restrictions. And you won't believe it, but these restrictions are uh, challenged on a regular basis, primarily by the alcohol industry who feel that the restrictions are, are limiting their profits from alcohol sales. It also it identified the need to get communities involved in services early, so to get women and families uh, involved in childcare, um, family services, and that led to the development and, and building of the Bayagawi Children and Family Centre. It led to the development of the Maralu unit, which is a unit which educates the community but also provides support for families living with FASD. And it led to uh, the development of a fi family violence shelter and associated legal services um, to give women and children a safe place in the community uh, when they were in trouble. Uh, and there has also been service development as a result of this. One of the more recent um, collaborations has been with the Royal Far West to provide multidisciplinary trauma-informed care to children and families, often by telemedicine to the Fitzroy Valley. So what other things have happened beyond the Lillen One project? Well, we did get some NHMRC funding to set up a number of support services. So the Jandu Yani U project is a positive parenting program, which is being introduced into the Fitzroy Valley to support families of children with FASD. The Alert Problem, which is a program which is being led by Jane and James Fitzpatrick, who you saw in the movie, is to um, put an intervention into schools to try and enable children to better control their impulses and concentrate uh, on their schoolwork. But despite all the benefits from this study, we are seeing still some adverse outcomes in kids who we identified with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Just one example is, is a young boy of 11 who was in our cohort, uh, stole a car and he had in it six other children who were in our cohort, one of whom was killed when the car uh, crashed and several of whom were injured. And of course that child then had to leave the community because of the, the threats to his uh, well-being. We've had incidents where um, children have uh, for example, got into the school and uh, vandalised the school. And again, they're often children with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. So these children were not diagnosed till often till 11 or 12 or even later. Um, and really by that time, some of these behaviours and the poor self-esteem are entrenched. Uh, I mentioned that we now know um, that one in three children in WA in youth detention have fetal alcohol spectrum disorder and unfortunately some of those were the children who were in our uh, study. So although we've made great gains and the community's made great gains, we still have a long way to go. You'll all be aware of the, uh, the Royal Commission into Children in Juvenile Detention and of course one of the things that came out very clearly there was that many of these children had fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. And this is one of the few causes of brain damage and birth defects that can be prevented. Um, some good news is that Tristan is now nearly 20, he's 19, um, and he runs a successful lawn mowing, lawn mowing business with the help of Jeff, his, his father. So Jeff does all the money and makes the appointments and Tristan does all the physical work and, and is currently um, saving quite a lot of money. Uh, and we have been asked by the community to, would we go back and track what has been the trajectory of these children? because despite putting in services, despite raising awareness, as I said, we're concerned that some of these children are still having uh, poor outcomes. And so we've been asked to do the Biggers One project, which is the um, project about adolescent kids. But this project has had a, a lot of national impacts as well. Um, one of the key things was that Jane mentioned we had the support of the Human Rights Commission and Mick Gooder was very uh, generous in including this study and also the governance structure the community had developed in his social justice report of 2010, which goes to the Prime Minister. And he also highlighted the need for research that is a genuine partnership, not doing research on communities, but with communities, um, underpinned by meaningful, respectful engagement and collaboration. 
Um, Quentin Bryce continued her interest in this project and here you can see her out at Bayula School and following the project has taken up the role as patron for No FASD, which is the national organisation to support parents and children living with FASD. The data have been presented at many forums, particularly by Aboriginal people, for example the, the Male Health Summit uh, and there was a National Grog Summit. Uh, where they were very interested in having real data from real communities that was current and relevant to Australia. And, and of course Aboriginal people are leading the way in education about this disorder and how it might be prevented. Uh, we've made, <clears throat> in addition to Tristan, uh, an, another film about the story of alcohol and Indigenous leadership uh, and fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. And we've given these three films uh, to Edward uh, Yajalara, Tristan, and this story of alcohol in the Indigenous communities so that they'll be available for, for people to use at the library. Kate Conagrave, one of our other academics uh, at the University of Sydney, has written a handbook for people working in Aboriginal communities with drug and alcohol, and we were able to contribute to that. Um, we've had our first Australasian conference uh, a couple of years ago in FASD, and of course June Oscar spoke, uh, gave a keynote at that, and many of our Aboriginal colleagues presented at that meeting. And we were also asked to participate in an insight program, and Tristan and his parents featured in that program, but most importantly, it emphasised children and families who were non-Aboriginal, uh, and I think that was a very uh, important message for the general Australian community. This project also resulted in a lot of academic outcomes and of course that's always important for universities. So we've had uh, one, two, three, four, seven PhDs, six completed. Um, we've had a number of postdoctoral fellows who've participated uh, in this program. It's also had quite an impact on policy and services. So we had interest very early on in this project from Sharman Stone, who developed a group called Parliamentarians for the Prevention of FASD, and used to invite us regularly down to Parliament House in Canberra to speak to a, a group of interested people. And she then initiated an inquiry into fetal alcohol spectrum disorder for Australia. And we were the first uh, group who were interviewed uh, in the, in, as part of the inquiry, and we were also to, able to provide the results of our study in this report uh, to the government. And this resulted in the publication of a, a report in 2012, and subsequently support by both uh, major parties and an allocation of $20 million to address this issue. So I think this just demonstrates that a very small project starting in a very remote community with a very small amount of philanthropic money can have a huge impact um, on uh, what's happening nat nationally. And what this funding has enabled us to do is a number of things. For example, uh, develop an Australian guide to the diagnosis of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder and roll that out. We've developed a website which is available for researchers, families, uh, policy makers and um, uh, any, anyone really of interest. Uh, we'd be very happy for you to have a look at that website and provide feedback. And it does have a lot of uh, videos, all the Australian publications and Australian services uh, on that site. Um, we were able to get funding for No FASD specifically to enable them to develop their website and resources, but also to develop a telephone line, a helpline for families uh, or others with questions about alcohol in pregnancy and FASD. And this money also funded the develop development of a number of resources which have been rolled out over Aboriginal communities nationally. Um, subsequently, we were able to secure NHMRC funding for a Centre of Research Excellence in Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder, which is based both in Sydney uh, and in Perth, and I co-direct that with Professor Carol Bauer from Perth, and Jane is one of our chief investigators on that project. But also there was some local funding. So for example, in New South Wales, we received four year funding for a multidisciplinary clinic based out at the Children's Hospital at Westmead, which also has a role in training and education. New South Wales Health have seen the need to develop videos, pamphlets and storybooks specifically for um, health professionals and others who are working in Indigenous communities, but importantly for men and youth as well. 
there's been a lot of advocacy. So we've been participating in, for example, the development of the national FASD guidelines for the next 10 years, the National Alcohol Strategy, World Health Organization, College of Physicians and AMA uh, guidelines. We've been involved in assisting lawyers in advocating for policy change for the reason that Jane mentioned, uh, to try and enable recognition of these conditions as, as disabilities so that pe people can apply for NDIS funding and carers and disability allowances. Uh, we've been involved in a number of inquiries aside from the one I mentioned. Inquiries, for example, into uh, mental health in remote communities, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder in the Northern Territory alcohol use in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. And of course, the results have been disseminated widely through the media and scientific meetings. Um, and this is just an example. Uh, Gilbert and Tobin, a law firm, uh, recently launched their document, really advocating for a change in law and policy for recognition of disability such as we see in fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. So that we're not just relying, for example, on a cutoff IQ of uh, below 70, we're relying on the functional impairment of a child and recognising that this is one of those conditions that can result in significant functional impairment uh, for life. There's also been some global impacts. So Jane mentioned that Yajalara was presented at the UN and some years later we were able to present the little one data at the UN at the Permanent Forum for Indigenous Issues and also to show the film Tristan. And what was really important for the community members who accompanied us on that trip, so June here and Marmanji, who you've met, uh, is that they were able to realise that fetal alcohol spectrum disorder and alcohol use in pregnancy is a key problem in many Indigenous communities throughout the world and, and had a sense of feeling uh, not alone in trying to deal with this problem. Um, we've been contributors to uh, international textbooks, um, to a prevention charter for prevention for FASD uh, and to various other uh, international guidelines, including from the World Health Organization. Now, none of these projects um, happen without a lot of input from a lot of people. Um, and you can see that the, the team that we had is, is large. Um, and many of those people are, are still working in this field. Um, we were very keen to promote the Aboriginal people working in this area and all of the Aboriginal collaborators are authors on all of the papers that came out of this project and there must be about 30 publications and reports now that have come out. Um, and finally funding is crucial and we really couldn't do this without not only funding from philanthropy, the NHMRC and the government, but also the pro bono help as Jane mentioned, from advertising agencies such as Saatchi, law firms such as uh, Gilbert and Tobin, and NGOs such as the Foundation for Alcohol Research and Education and the National Organisation for FASD. So we, we always need to acknowledge the input that they've had. So what I'd like to do now is, is end the formal presentation and really ask Jane up here and, and open it up for, for questions and discussion. So we do have a mic if anyone's got any comments on the, the film or the project or questions. Thank you, Thank you both. That was fabulous, and, but shocking, of course. Um, is, um, you've obviously been working in this community now for quite a while. Is there, are there any data or any other um, suggestion that the rate of um, fast day presentation in the community you've been working with is declining? Well, we do have some evidence that alcohol use in pregnancy is decreasing. Uh, it's decreased significantly. Awareness amongst the community is very high about the harms of alcohol, and many people have stopped drinking during pregnancy. Sadly, there are major problems with services in all of these remote communities. So there's a paucity of drug and alcohol services, mental health services, psychology services. There is no child psychologist in the whole of the Kimberley region. There's no child psychiatrist who regularly visits. And, and that's really one of the reasons that we've agreed to this follow-up study, so that we can just say, despite all this knowledge, 
And although we've made advances and although there's been funding for additional services, it's not adequate. And my feeling as a paediatrician is that what we need is the sort of multidisciplinary team that we had working together, available all the time in these sorts of communities. Because we didn't just treat diagnosed fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, we treated scabies and asthma and injuries and whatever came our way. And one of the major problems for services in these communities is not only attracting people, but retaining them. And part of the reason for not retaining them is that it's so isolating and lonely. And many of these, uh, particularly allied health professionals and psychologists, are young, single women. Accommodation's difficult, travel's difficult, climate's difficult. And yet, if you're working in a team, you're all supporting each other and you're coming to a joint diagnosis and management plan, as opposed to the physio coming out one week, the OT the next week, the psychologist you know, the next month, and the paediatrician somewhere in between. So we're really still advocating for that sort of service. And in fact, June and I have been asked to speak to the Labor Caucus on Monday morning uh, in Canberra and we're going to be advocating really services are still a major problem and surely we can think of creative ways of providing services that are not excessively expensive. And actually just one thing I'd say, just back in your original question, the uh, Little One Project looked at all children aged seven and eight across the Fitzroy Valley. That means they were born before those women are brought in the alcohol restrictions. So we would really hope to think that, you know, bringing in those alcohol restrictions really decreased the prevalence of the condition. And if we repeated the study now, we would hope to see that there were less children affected. But as Liz said, the services, services for recovering alcoholics, helping women to stay off the alcohol. They want to stay off, but they're chronically, they've got chronic alcoholism. You know, they're pregnant, what to do. There are no services there to support them. And so that'll probably be other things that you're talking mm. about. Yeah. I think one other point to make is that we now know that, well, we know that FASD occurs in generations. So we know that some of the mums of the kids that we diagnosed mm. also had sure. FASD, even though they hadn't been diagnosed, and even some of the grannies. Um, so we now have a situation in many of these communities, and this would be repeated throughout Australia in remote communities in New South Wales, Queensland, South Australia, is that the grannies, people our age, and mum and G's age are looking after these little children, mm. but little children with significant difficulties. Um, so that is really a major problem. And, and I, again, I think the advantage of diagnosing a child is, should be that we should be able to get help for that woman to prevent the birth of another child. And we should be able to identify the women who really don't have the capability themselves of either stopping drinking or, or um, looking after children with disabilities. Hi, um, I was just interested around the, if there's any link, and I know your research is on the health side, but has there been any links between like the hospitality industry and their responsibility across, actually no, Fitzroy River, I used to work for the owner of the Fitzroy River Lodge. And so I know a lot about the issues up there, but um, I know like they're trying, like the NT bringing in the banned drinkers register and things like that, but actually the hospitality industry generally, do they, is there any, known linkages with programs or advocacy around that space? Actually, I mean, you raised a very important point there. In actual fact, the um, organised, the pubs that are selling alcohol into the community are predominantly Indigenous organisations. Um, and if we look at the crossing in, you know, it's owned by legal and, yeah, uh, organisations that are owned by the Aboriginal people and it's selling into the community to make a profit but you know, into those that are most vulnerable and disadvantaged. And that is a significant um, issue for the community to try and sort out uh, because there are a few people that are making maybe a lot of profit from what's happening there, but at a huge cost to the community. So, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think what you're getting at is what is, are they taking their responsibility seriously? Mm -hmm. So um, they, for example, there are now signs in the pumps um, there are warning labels on the glasses about alcohol use in pregnancy. We've had a big win actually this week in that the Food and Drugs Administration have finally decided to mandate warning labels 
about alcohol use in pregnancy on all our alcohol. That previously happened to Australian alcohol that was exported overseas, but um, not in Australia. So, I mean, it's a very difficult situation and the alcohol industry is very strong and the government is very unwilling to make the real changes that we know will work. So our government should be raising the cost of alcohol through taxation and minimum pricing. They should be saying we don't need... That's just come in the NT, that's a great um, advance. Um, in Newcastle there was a restriction to opening hours of pubs that had a dramatic impact but that's that being reversed um, with community pressure. Um, we should be enforcing alcohol restrictions, particularly locally enforced uh, restrictions. So what people in Fitzroy can do now is they can uh, enact some legislation that makes their house alcohol free. So if someone brings alcohol to the house and they've got kids there, they can ring the police and get them to come uh, and deal with that. But we've really got to be looking at you know, much broader issues, promotion of alcohol, advertising of alcohol. We know that's very influential uh, and yet we're not grappling with that, even though some of these laws would bring profits to the government which could be used for prevention. So I'm not sure we've quite answered your question, but it, you know, all the, the um, intent is there, um, but it's very difficult when you're dealing with a, a, a big profitable industry who does support government. Mm. Just um, um, the, the cost of alcohol and increasing the cost, the floor price and whatnot. People pay big amounts of money for the alcohol in communities at any rate, so I don't think cost is a big, big factor. Um, and it also has the knock-on effect of people um, being robbed of money for other people to buy the alcohol. So you, the community has a certain amount of money, and if you increase it on alcohol, there'll be less for food or, wh or whatever. Um, other things like the Thirsty Thursdays and all of that do have that impact, but that was just one comment. But my other bigger comment is around the FASD, but there's also end-stage renal disease, um, uh, chronic ontotus media, you know, whatever, whatever. And there seems to be a lot of those specific reactions that end up like what's going on here now with FASD, but it doesn't seem to get an address and more underlining issue around communities coping with all of these different impacts that go on. And it, it's great there. I'm not, you know, this is absolutely understand all of the thing behind and whatnot, but it's just another one of a whole litany of things that can sometimes be addressed well. Sometimes say like the syphilis stuff, yep, addressed really well, then they withdraw the services somewhat, then the syphilis rates go up again, or something else or something else. It seems to be a bit of a miss. Sorry, I ranted a bit. You want me to comment? Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I, I think just a, a couple of responses. One is that, of course, many diseases that we see in disadvantaged communities have their origin in the social and economic uh, disadvantage that these communities have. And, and so to address them, we ought to be trying to address the, the, the causal factors rather than dealing with the, the top end. Um, in response to your question about pricing, I think there's some very good evidence, particularly from Central Australia, from John Boffer in, and uh, Alice Springs, that even a tiny increase in the cost of alcohol can significantly reduce purchasing power and consumption because it's the people that are most disadvantaged who are often um, have limited amounts of money. So I, I don't really buy the fact that um, increasing the price and increasing taxation won't have an impact in these sorts of communities. Um, there was another point I was going to make, but I've, I've forgotten that. Yeah, and I think, I mean, the other thing is, uh, you know, it comes back to a, a good point that really the solutions must be community driven and community initiated because, you know, solutions imposed by government um, that are often, as you say, short term funding for a period of time where we bring in some services, but we don't have any sustainability or um, you know, and then the next government's in and we change that so it's pulled out and therefore, so they must, and what we see in these communities is often, it, you know, people and the Indigenous leaders understand the issues and they're not waiting for government to solve the problems, they're driving their own solutions to the problem and it's government coming in and ensuring that their own solutions are sustainable and scalable within that community. 
because that's maybe a way to ensure that they, they're there for a longer time. The problems are owned by the community and the solutions are owned by them as well. Um, I mean, you mentioned about some other problems in Indigenous communities, such as the high rate of renal failure. And we're really now beginning to think in, on the basis of results from animal studies that actually that uh, in utero exposure to alcohol may actually be determining later health outcomes. Yeah, and at, it, yeah, and so, um, so some of those other outcomes may actually relate to alcohol. Mm. Um, and yes, you, you're right that we need to take a, an overview of what, what's the, what are the causal factors and try and address those. I'm curious um, uh, to know what adult life is like for um, children who grow up with FA, with FASD. Uh, does the management plan include specific, say, employment services um, that assist with adults who are FA, FASD sufferers? Yes, look, that's one of the things that we're grappling with at the moment, and there's really a limited number of people who are willing to assess adults and adolescents with uh, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder or know how to, to help them. I mean, mainly the problems for adults are self-care and, and independent living, and as you say, um, employment. Uh, and most of them, about in a longitudinal study from the states of several hundred children um, in adult, who grew up to, to be adults, um, only 10% or less than 10% were able to live and work independently. So what a lot of these kids or young adults need is an external brain, someone like Jeff, who can help them to manage their problems. I mentioned that increasingly we're seeing evidence, particularly from Canada, that there are a lot of uh, mental health problems, suicide, uh, drug and alcohol use, and also organic problems, you know, problems with the kidneys, the um, heart, the pancreas, that might have been primed by this exposure in utero. So we really do need health professionals who are aware of the range of problems. Um, I mentioned, I think, in one of my slides, difficulties with sexuality. Um, you know, there's problems with sexual identity that um, seem to be more common in this population. There are problems in that these are vulnerable children who may themselves have been subject to sexual abuse, who then may become perpetrators. Um, remembering that quite a lot of these children, for example, Tristan has an IQ of about 60. so. He won't ever learn to read and write. He won't ever be in, able to be entirely dependent. And in communities like Fitzroy, where we've got a fifth of the children potentially growing up into adults who need that support, people like June Oscar are thinking, well, you know, what can we do? How can we develop mechanisms where there's some supported living and so, some supported work and good knowledge amongst health professionals and others? and the justice professionals particularly, about the way these, these children behave and how they can be supported into adulthood. Mm. And I think, you know, they, uh, well I know a year or so ago, they were looking at every industry or external stakeholder that comes into that community. They wanted to ask them, first of all, what plan did they have for these children who had FASD? What plan would there be for their employment? So they're looking for therapeutic economies, you know, how was their organisation going to be, offer, be able to offer jobs to understand the high prevalence of FASD that exists in their community? And I think it was smart and strategic that. Right? Um, in um, Fitzroy, I think, you know, I mentioned about 30% of these kids had been in touch with child protection. In the clinic that I do in Sydney, it's more like 75%, 80%. So m many of the children I see are in foster or adoptive care. They've been um, removed from their mum because she's been unable to, to care for them properly. So really that shifts the problem from biological families to um, adoptive families and to um, community and, and child protection services. Um, justice is a big problem and, and they are just suddenly realising that a lot of the kids they see have this problem. So of course they're kids who don't learn from their mistakes, they don't understand right from wrong, they follow uh, their friends easily, they want to be liked. And in these sorts of communities, there's nowhere to put these kids except mm. in jail. So they do something trivial and then they end up in jail. Um, so the police 
in these communities really need an understanding of what to expect, how to deal with these children, and there needs to be some sort of alternative pathway to, in, uh, to prevent incarceration. We've got children, adults in Australia, who've been in jail for several years because they're deemed um, unable to provide evidence you know, to support their charge. Um, and subsequently, several of them have been found to have fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. In other words, you know, they, they were never recognised as having a very low IQ um, and are just sort of ending up uh, in the justice system with no progress of their case. I just wanted to ask, at what stage are the children is there any antenatal screening as there is for ear defects? At what stage are these children diagnosed? The um, best antenatal screening is knowledge of the mother and her alcohol use and direct questioning during, sensitive questioning during pregnancy about alcohol use and <coughs> advice and referral to services if the woman is found to be drinking. If we see a woman who's says that she's drunk very heavily without realising she's pregnant. We can do um, screening such as ultrasound screening. We can measure the baby's head size, the baby's growth. We can look for cardiac defects. We can look for defects of the face. Um, it, but it would be very unusual for termination to be offered, for example, unless there was you know, severe um, impairment. There is some screening available um, after birth, which is a bit late, um, looking for alcohol in the meconium, um, but that only indicates sort of more recent alcohol use in the third trimester. Uh, increasingly, we're able to screen after birth to look at the genes and their um, chemical composition um, to see whether they've been altered, switched on or off by alcohol exposure, and that may prove in the, in the longer term to be diagnostic. But there's a lot of work being done at the moment to, to try and identify how we can screen for alcohol use in pregnancy and how we can identify children early. The best thing is knowing about alcohol um, and the other thing is knowing the groups at risk. So children of women who are alcohol dependent, uh, children who've got siblings with a diagnosis, children who enter the foster um, system, children who enter the justice system. Um, children who live in disadvantage in communities where there's been long-term alcohol use, obviously we need to have a high index of suspicion in them if they present with growth, development and behavioural problems. Unfortunately, there's, I didn't go into the detail of diagnosis, but there's no diagnostic test, obviously, for, for this condition, and, and that means there's a deal of scepticism about. However, we diagnose attention deficit disorder on clinical symptoms. We diagnose autism spectrum disorder on clinical symptoms. We, you know, many of these behavioural and learning problems, th there's not a diagnostic test. And that's why that study was so difficult to do and that's why it hadn't been done probably previously because it involved a huge multidisciplinary team to try and diagnose this condition. And in fact, just coming back to someone's question about do we know what's happening to rates of FASD, we, we don't have the capacity to yeah, uh, mount another study like this and in fact what we should be doing is encouraging services to record the cases, uh, record the diagnoses and we are doing that. Thank you both very much for the presentation and the film. I, what's occurred to me is it, it, you're talking very much obviously about women, the women who expect the children, the women who care for the children and the women who become things like teachers and nurses and so on. But what about the men in the community? I mean, the men in any community, when a, when a woman is known to be pregnant and insists on drinking, I, 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 I just, I haven't really got the question that I need to ask you, I think. It's, it's just, isn't this part of the community that men should be involved in this issue because the children are the children of two people. They're not the children of one, the child, each isn't a child of one person. I, but 
maybe I'm just no, no, going I, off I, into la la. I, I think for, from, that's a very, saying. very important comment, and, and I'll make two responses. Is that we've done quite a lot of work about why women drink during pregnancy, and often it's not their lack of knowledge of harms; it's their tolerant attitude to alcohol use, and which reflects our tolerant attitude in the um, community in general. But one of the key factors is whether their partner drinks. So if their partner's drinking, it's very difficult for them to stop drinking during, in pre during pregnancy. So there are a number of things that are, are in place to address this. New South Wales Health has developed some videos that I mentioned. One of them is targeting men. And the message is, if your wife is trying to get pregnant, if you're trying to get pregnant as a couple, or if you are pregnant, expecting a baby, then you should stop drinking to support your wife. And there's also a, a um, campaign running at the moment from the Foundation for Alcohol Research and Education, which is called the Pregnant Pause Campaign. And again, that's trying to encourage men to take responsibility for the outcome of their um, child. Mm -hmm. so, so there is acknowledgement that men have a major factor. And I think the labelling, although the labelling of a bottle may not change behaviour, it raises awareness and it really gets that, again, that broader community aware of, of the potential for harm. Mm. But, and interestingly, I mean, anecdotally, we did hear in the community that a lot of women were drinking because of spousal pressure. The, you know, the men wanted the women to be drinking with them and things despite even when they were pregnant so that it you know, pointed again at the importance of intervening with men uh, and helping them to understand that they should not be drinking themselves nor encouraging their wife to drink during that uh, nine months of pregnancy. And I mean, another complexity in, in this and other um, disadvantaged communities is often the man is not on the scene during the pregnancy. And, and again, you know, the disadvantage in a single mum struggling mm. through a pregnancy um, it, it means that they continue to drink. But certainly we're trying to raise that awareness in men rather than women. Um, even in health professionals, I'm sorry to say, there's a, a deal of scepticism about this problem and also a reluctance to even ask and advise about alcohol in pregnancy. So we've done surveys of health professionals less than 50% of health professionals who see pregnant women ask routinely about alcohol use in pregnancy, partly because they don't know what to advise and they don't know where to refer them. Conversely, in our national studies of women, we found that over 90% want to be asked by their health professional, they want to be advised about the harms, and they want to be told not to drink because it's much easier to get a clear message, my doctor says I can't drink rather than a message, oh, well, the GP said a couple of drinks won't hurt and it might relax me and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of misinformation out there. And, you know, some of our colleagues who don't see the children, which I see, for example, the obstetricians, are reluctant to raise this issue. They'll tell us not to eat soft cheese or pate because of the one in millions of chances of listeria. Um, but they won't, and they'll tell us not to smoke. Um, They'll tell us to exercise and diet, you know, adhere to a diet during pregnancy. They're very reluctant to advise against alcohol. And again, that comes back to that whole societal attitude to alcohol. And the reason that any of these public health and education and other measures need to be underpinned by some sort of legislation that at least minimises harm. We're not talking about prohibition of alcohol, we're talking about minimising harm. Um, we've reached the end of today's seminar, so I wanted to sincerely thank Jane and Liz for sharing with us.